Welcome back, dear friends, to our channel Manhua Fury Manhua starts with Victor, who positions a blade beneath Eileen's chin and icily interrogates her motives. Eileen smiles sarcastically, thinking of how kind her sweetheart is. She remarks that he has finally decided to look at her with those fiery eyes, the way he usually looks at that woman. Aileen casts a glance at the cowering blonde-haired woman, a woman who never gets her hands dirty and knows how to shed tears pitifully, the kind and frail Charlotte. Victor plunges a sword inside her, explaining how by committing the crimes of practicing evil magic and attempting to harm Charlotte, she single-handedly led House Mertensia to its ruin. Aileen scoffs and curses him bitterly, a curse that makes it so that he has no choice but to love her. She then collapses. Charlotte trembles, telling Victor how bad she feels about Aileen since she has to die a painful death. But Victor holds no pity for her. Aileen ponders just what is so different between her and Charlotte. Why does she get to be comforted in everyone's arms while she is forced to meet such a painful death? Young Minji abruptly jolted awake. She drowsily wonders what a random dream she had. As she gets ready for the day, he wonders why that gorgeous woman is dying in her dream. She silently prays that she died without any regrets. But it was true what they say, be careful what you wish for. As Yeon Minji woke up in a completely unfamiliar environment and body, it was only then that she realized who the woman in her dream was and why she was dying. The people here call her Aileen Mertensia, the notorious villainess. However, they are wrong. I don't think so. To be more precise, she is Yun Minji, currently possessing the body of the villainess who appears in the novel Lady Lily. And the so-called author of this novel was her, whom she wrote about ten years ago. But to make things worse for Minji, of all the characters in the novel, she became the villainous Aileen. Unlike the beautiful and well-liked female lead Charlotte, she was renowned as a witch. Minji was far from the mean girl type like Aileen in the novel. She was, in fact, always a pushover and could never say no. But she has no interest in dying painfully like Aileen and is determined not to live as a villainess. She has power, money, honor, and even looks. She has finally achieved her dream of living as a rich couch potato. But sadly, Aileen has everything but a perfect family. She has a father who neglects her, Duke Vincent Mertensia, and a brother who seems to despise her. And so Aileen currently spends her day binge reading Linte's romantic novel. A while later, she looks outside the window to see Falengia, a solar eclipse. Late Empire, which is the setting of this novel, has a powerful emperor and is called the Land of the Brilliant Sun, where night never falls. However, the shadows cast by those brilliant rays hide a dark past. When Falengia occurred five centuries ago, Kyle, the most notorious warlock of all time, made an entire kingdom vanish overnight. Thus, people are afraid of Falengia, as it covers the sun, which is the symbol of the emperor. But in reality, our female lead just made up a name that sounded cool for her novel. Aileen drowses off, excited for the next day as Linty's limited edition novel will be awaiting her tomorrow. Aileen's peaceful plans, her love for her father, and her love for her mother are the only things that make her happy. Her friends, however, get disrupted. The next morning, Aileen is shocked as the maid tells her how Linty's limited edition novel will arrive tomorrow. She realizes that she is stuck in a time loop where the day of Falengia is repeating itself. Meanwhile, a man feels a sense of déjà vu stronger than ever, which he finds quite unpleasant. Aileen tries to go to sleep to get rid of her current predicament. However, when she opened her eyes the next day, Linta's limited edition novel was not waiting for her. She was still stuck on the same day. She ponders over what's happening. She wonders if it's God's wish for her to stop living life as a hermit. A window appears stating that the novel is currently undergoing maintenance. She decides to wait for the manager to fix the issue and continue to enjoy living as a rich slacker. Several days passed by and Aileen was stuck on the same day. There was only one thing that made a living inside this novel bearable, and that was Linta. She becomes determined to move on to the next day, no matter what. She has tried going out for the past ten days and has explored the streets, but nothing has worked. A sudden thought crossed her mind. 
She wonders if to move on to the next day, she has to confront the man who's going to kill her. The main characters. She frustratingly flings the book to the other side of the room, unintentionally hitting the maid. The book hits the maid's head, causing her forehead to bleed. The maid quivers in fear of her mistress and immediately begins begging for mercy. Aileen stares at her awkwardly, telling her to calm down. Meanwhile, a man's subordinate praises him for having insight into the future. The man becomes a man of his dreams. He becomes pissed at his subordinate and has a strong urge to kill him. To calm him down, the subordinate begins preparing tea for him. It is only when the tea accidentally spills that the man realizes why he's feeling irritated. It wasn't just a sense of deja vu. In fact, this has actually happened countless times. He chuckles. Controlling time is entirely under God's jurisdiction. The man remarks that it seems he has broken his mind. He's not sure if he's going to be able to do it. He's not sure if he's going to break the laws of causality. This was quite amusing for him, and he decided to snap this person's neck, as that would be the only polite thing to do. Meanwhile, the maid was still weeping. She only stops when Aileen threatens to eat her up if she doesn't stop. Aileen then stares at the wound and is about to say that it might scar, but it halts. She rather exclaims that the floor might scar. The next morning, Aileen drowsily wakes up to find the weather changed, unlike the loop she was stuck in. The maid announces that the book she ordered has arrived. It is only when she examines Linty's limited edition book in her hands that she realizes she is out of the time loop. Suddenly, Aileen's brother, Aslan informs her that their father is looking for her. And so, in her father's office, Aileen is confronted over her changed behavior. Apparently, she faked an illness to decline all the social gathering invitations that she used to love and brought books when she couldn't even get through a single sentence before. He reveals his decision to hire someone to teach her, taking her aback. Just then, the door opens and a figure pulls her shoulders back remarking that her posture must be worked on first. Vincent introduces the man as Aileen's tutor and personal butler. The man introduces himself as Sebastian. Vincent confesses how he has high expectations for him, as he's the second son of Viscount Agate, a house with a rich history and tradition. This makes her wonder, and she asks why he hasn't taken off his hood yet. Her father frowns, saying he's dressed impeccably as a butler. This makes Aileen more confused. Out of the blue, the man begins to laugh. He says, laughing wickedly, asking if that is how he looks in the lady's eyes. And suddenly, an endless feeling of foreboding overcame Aileen. Truly, the way her father describes the man's appearance doesn't make any sense. But she goes with it, making the man grin. He walks closer to her, assuring her she has plenty of time to learn everything before the Imperial Ball and the Harvest Festival, even without having to repeat a day. Aileen finally understands that the man is aware of the time loop. The man asks her to close her eyes and chant some unpleasant incantations, making Aileen wonder whether he's a warlock. He then tries to strangle her, but suddenly, waves of energy spark through her. On the other hand, Victor finds a woman in trouble during one of his walks. He saves her by killing the man who is troubling her and questioning her. She, to his surprise, isn't scared of her and, rather, hugs him. This makes him interested as he has never seen a woman like her before. On the other hand, Aileen gasps for air and asks the man why he's trying to kill her. The man reveals how it's been a while since he tried so hard to find someone. He then confesses how he had to repeat a very unpleasant day over and over again because of her. He demands comfort from her and makes her look up. He mumbles that she looks like a human, yet magic doesn't work on her. Seeing her surprised, he questions her, saying she should know about it, considering she's a noble. Aileen wonders how he is able to use both magic and witchcraft when they are opposites. It should be an impossible thing to do. The man comes closer to her and remarks how she is dripping with so much love and Les Rive's energy that she positively reeks. Les Rive is the name of the one and only god of the late empire. However, Les Rive was only a symbolic figure in her novel. She asks the man if he means Les Rive actually exists. The man chuckles at her odd question. 
He casts magic, asking if she should be questioning this when her whole body is proof of Les Rive's existence. This makes her frown, but it might be true since the man's spells don't seem to work on her. Aileen may have been a heinous villain, but she was just a normal lady without any abilities or power. She certainly wasn't loved by Les Rive, or was capable of causing time loops or deflecting magic. There's no reason why her body should have any traces of Lesrev. Hence, all this must have started when Yun Minji possessed Aileen's body, making her wonder if God loved her then. And so, the time loop was all Lesrez was doing despite it being a risky business. The protagonist realizes that the only difference between those repeated days and the last day is that she acts like a villainess. After that, the loop stopped. According to this, one could say that Lesrev wants her to follow the storyline, live life as the villainous Aileen and die. Teary-eyed, she asks if this is a curse. The man bursts into laughter, saying, who knew a god would fall into one-sided love? He mumbles how he has changed his mind and asks if she has heard Lesrev's voice. Sarah received any direct revelations. She denies it, and the man explains that it's like Lesrev wants her to figure out what he wants all on her own, no different from a spoiled child. Aileen remarks that that's one irresponsible god to whom the man confesses he likes her and asks if she has any wishes she desires. He explains how a god loves her, and he despises following divine will. Not only that, but to the man it seems Lesrev has fully incurred her wrath so that they can become good partners. She protests that she isn't loved. The man says even if she isn't, disrupting her god-given fate together is a good way to mess with divine will and so he proposes a deal to betray God together, revealing how he can ruin Lesrev's image completely. Aileen knew Warlock to be a monster that fed on human happiness. A woman who must live as a villainess until she meets her death decides to make a deal with the demon. But what's surprising is that such a man never made an appearance in the novel. She asks him to reveal his real name and face now. He says this is his real face, shocking her while at the same time making her excited. He then reveals his name to be Asher. Aileen recognizes the name as that of an evil warlock from five centuries ago. She sympathizes with him, knowing that living with such a name must be tough, as it's the same as someone on earth named Hitler. And so the deal was sealed. Asher begins to train Aileen in etiquette immediately. Seeing that the man knew what she liked and treasured, Eileen asks if he used his hypnosis abilities on the maids and her father. While hypnosis only allows one to brainwash and control someone, his abilities allow him to bring out and satisfy a person's deeply hidden desires. This makes her realize that Vincent must have truly wished for his daughter to have a tutor and butler. Thanks to that, she is getting a crash course in etiquette. There was something Aileen overlooked when she made the deal with Asher. His accepting his proposal meant that they'd have to stick together as much as possible to share information efficiently. And she only realized this after he had appointed her tutor and butler. Asher. Finally, inquires who she is. He comments on how she seems to have given up hopes of looking presentable. And her posture and habits seem no different than those of a commoner. It's as if she has lived in complete seclusion. She responds strangely to certain things, and her speech and behavior are odd, too. He remarks that no matter how ignorant she is, as long as she's a human born in this world, the normal response after hearing the war in Warlock would be to tremble and shout for God's mercy. Moreover, she didn't blink an eye when she heard his name. She interjects, saying the last bit isn't true. She says she knows who Asher, the evil warlock was, but it seems they just happened to have the same name. Asher hums in agreement but states that hating on God isn't still normal. Asher announces time is up and reveals she can find her identity himself. Aileen gulps in fear, knowing he will. Definitely, definitely kill her the second he finds she is the author of this novel. As, in a sense, authors are gods who create worlds. And Asher seems to despise gods. Suddenly there's a knock on the door, but before Aileen can answer it, she stumbles. However, Asher steadies her before she can crash and says there seem to be a lot of things he needs to teach her. Aileen answers the door and finds a servant outside. 
Eileen recognizes her as a sucker. The maid offers her several blatant compliments, but the current Aileen knows better and isn't one-minded like the previous one. She recognized the woman before her eyes as someone who would betray Eileen and play the biggest role in destroying House Mertensia. Her name is Sophia Beryl, and she's Aileen's lady-in-waiting. Due to her lack of response, a Sophia pretends to be hurt and cries. Though Aileen wants to avoid her, she finds it hard to get her out of the way, and she's not alone. She finds it hard to push her away. For some reason, she is reminded of her past life as a pushover. Sophia actively reveals how it's all Lady Charlotte's fault that she took away the crown prince from Aileen, whom she had feelings for. She goes on and on and shows Aileen the new dress she is thinking of for her. Aileen looks at the design and recognizes it to have been created by Charlotte, the main character of the novel. Charlotte is the main character of the novel, and Charlotte is from a poor Viscount family. She grew up in the countryside helping with farm work. One day she gathered her skirts up to prevent them from getting dirty and noticed how cute the skirts looked. Inspired by the shape, she sketched a new design for a dress on a piece of paper. Later on, Victor discovered her design and had the world's best designer, Paul Lanx, bring the dress to life. Charlotte's dress soon became popular and all the noble women wore the design to the Harvest Festival Ball. Aileen was one of them, and it was here that Aileen poured wine on Charlotte, whom Victor later saved. Minji was obsessed with dresses at the time she was writing the novel Lady Lily. That must be why this whole dress element was included in the storyline. Back then, she had no idea that wearing a dress would be this uncomfortable. Sophia continues indirectly calling out Aileen as a witch, saying she will be by her side even then. Asher finally steps up, asking Aileen why she has such a thing by her side. Using his charm magic, he asks Sophia what her name means. She replies that her father gave her the name in the hopes that she would be wise at all times. She then shouts out that if he wanted her to be wise, he should have just given her money. She confesses how her good-for-nothing father gave away all his fortune to beggars, saying it was his duty as a noble. Sophia began to reveal her innermost thoughts without any hesitation, and she looked relieved while doing it. Sophia then reveals how it's hard sucking up to a moody tramp like Aileen, and also how she has been smuggling away her belongings. Sophia continues revealing her wicked thoughts, and Asher asks Aileen how she wants to deal with them. Sophia then asks Eileen how she wants to deal with her wicked thoughts. As Yun Minji, she has no personal grudge against Sophia. Plus, the one Sophia deceived was Eileen from the novel. Though she may have become the villainous Eileen, she is still the coward Yun Minji. She chose to be used rather than disliked, and she could never say no. Even now, all she can think about is running away from reality. Asher walks closer to her, telling her she has nothing to fear as she has nothing. Asher walks closer to her, telling her she has nothing to fear, as she has nothing. Asher walks closer to her, telling her she has nothing. Asher walks closer to her with love, friends, or anything. He then reveals that since she doesn't like Sophia, she has two options. One is that she should punish and tame her or make her disappear from this world for good. Aileen chooses option one, and Asher makes her repeat after him that she will never raise a dog that bites its own master again. Though Aileen and Minji have led completely different lives, here's one that's different. Asher says, here's one thing they share in common. Neither of them has ever had decent people to rely on. Asher clicks his finger to remove Sophia from her trance, who immediately covers her mouth in shock at what she just revealed. Sophia swiftly goes down on her knees to beg for mercy, but Aileen feigns coldness and threatens her. She then has her thrown into the dungeons for the time being. Aileen smirked as Sophia was being dragged away mercilessly. This is the first time Aileen feels this way. Asher and Aileen were finally alone again. Asher asks why she is scared of her own lady in waiting when she has the courage enough to curse God. Knowing she shouldn't keep avoiding it, she reveals how she's from a different world and woke up here one day in Aileen's body. Asher reveals he had his suspicions, as she doesn't have a single aristocratic bone in her body. Cleverly disguising the truth, Aileen tells Asher everything, 
from how the loop stopped once she acted like a villainess to what would happen at the Harvest Ball and how everyone would revere Charlotte while shunning Aileen. And for some reason, Asher seems pleased. He reveals how a loop will eventually start again. But he asks that if Lesrev wanted the body's fate to be that of Aileen's original destiny, why would he choose her soul? She is the exact opposite of a villainess. And is from another world. Aileen realizes Asher is too intelligent for his good. She knows she was probably brought here because she's the author of the novel. She says she doesn't know, to which Asher randomly asks what she desires. She pauses and then replies that she wants the loop to stop. Asher realizes her powers don't work on her since she's from another world. He drops his cloak and says he is ready to listen to what she has to say. Aileen averts her eyes, saying they will talk after he puts his beauty away, knowing he has figured out her weakness. He agrees not to ask her for now and pretends to fall for her lies. He then suggests that if she really wants to escape the loop or her original destiny, she should become a real villainess, the one who steals the heroine's place. A true villainess. Aileen has never thought of such an idea. It is because every fairy tale she has read always shows the villainous being punished for their crimes in the end. But what if she becomes the protagonist and ultimately wins? Such advice was given by a true villain who confidently declares that he could take on God and promises to help her. Who could resist the temptation of a demon? Feeling she might have a chance, she asks him to teach her how to become a villainess. Asher grins and says it with pleasure. And so Asher and Aileen wait for the next day to arrive. Aileen is nervous, hoping another loop doesn't follow them. But Asher assures her there's probably a limit to how much time can be set back. And even God can't control it however they please. Aileen's theory is that a loop only occurs at points where Aileen appears in the novel. Now that she thinks about it, the day of Phalangia, which was also the day she hurt her maid, was when Aileen first appeared in Lady Lily and began her reign of terror. This means if she hustles, Aileen doesn't appear in the novel until the Harvest Festival day, and she'll be able to change her fate. After Aileen is dressed up, she goes outside to see that Asher isn't wearing his cloak like usual in front of the maids. She points it out, to which she reveals that those born with mana inevitably attract misfortune, and it can rub off on those around them like a curse. He explains how he wrapped his whole body with a cloak to suppress his mana, but there are plenty of other things that can replace it. He reveals his tattoo, and Aileen is shocked to see the snake tattoo move. Upon asking, Asher reveals it's a spell that completely drains his mana and vitality. Aileen asks if he will be okay, taking him aback. He asks what she said, saying his hearing has worsened with age. Aileen asks how old he is, and he reveals he must be over 500 years old. He then shows Aileen her time, explaining how her day will start at 5 in the morning. Instead of her lady-in-waiting, who's in the dungeon, her maids will help her bathe and get dressed. He smiles, telling her to complete it willingly before he decides to wait on her himself. She agrees, knowing she chose the path herself. As for Asher, he was excited. She is the only human that he cannot control with his abilities. It's as if she is like a blank sheet of paper. When all the conditions are met, he wonders what color will stain her. After that, Asher said, an evil reputation is still attention. Use that attention to steal Charlotte's spotlight at the ball. Aileen continues her etiquette lessons with Asher. He teaches her not to look down on others and not to mistake self-deprecation for modesty. To steal Charlotte's spotlight, Aileen decides not to wear the dress Charlotte designed. She reluctantly reveals she wants to wear a chemise dress, a dress usually worn as a nightgown. In the 18th century, the Queen of France, Marie Antoinette, designed a chemise dress. During a time when everyone was obsessed with plays, she wore the dress and appeared in a play herself. The dress became immensely popular, but Aileen isn't a king or queen. She happily explains to Asher how a chemi's dress doesn't constrict the body like a corset or stomacher. It also doesn't require panniers that add natural volume to the skirt. Asher points out how she looks happy and how it suits her. He then asks if she likes dresses. Aileen reveals how she briefly dreamed of becoming a designer when she was young, 
but she forgot about her dreams a long time ago as she was trying to make a living. The reason she wrote a scene about Charlotte designing a new dress was because the Yoon Minji from 10 years ago wanted to be like her. She was envious of Charlotte's life, a life of being loved without even trying. She then asks Asher if he had a dream, too, to which he responds that he forgot something like that even existed. She confesses how wearing such a dress will make people criticize her. Asher tells her that whatever she wants to do, own, or whatever might benefit her and make her happy, no matter what anyone says, she must do whatever she wants. But if she's worried still, he suggests giving them a good reason to criticize her. He says he then asks what designer she wants him to bring, as he can bring anyone. Aileen ponders and finally makes up her mind, grinning. On the other hand, Victor is told the Imperial Palace's exclusive designer, Polank, went on vacation and cannot be found as he has vanished without a trace. Charlotte tells Victor it's all right, as she wants to add a few more decorations. Today was the strangest day in Charlotte T's life. She can't believe something she wished for didn't come true. Everyone loves her, and someone always comes to her rescue when she's in danger. She thought all her good fortune was because God blessed her. She decides to go to Polance's home and search for clues despite his highness getting mad. However, she got caught in a flash by the knights. But she manages to make them give in with her charm. Reaching Polance's house, she finds a dark figure standing there. But suddenly it appears behind her, making her fall. She is surprised to learn that no one is coming to save her this time. Instead, she couldn't move at all. She reveals her name upon inquiry, making Asher realize who she really is. He says that for someone so beloved by God, he can't feel any energy from her at all. He remarks that a weed no one hesitates to pluck is better than a frail plant. Angry? Charlotte asks how he is to speak to her that way. She then asks if he is saying she's worth less than a weed. Asher agrees, saying that at least the weed is cute. Later on, Aileen makes the exclusive designer, Polans, make a dress for her by threatening him, Jin Lee, in the way Asher does. Polans is shocked to learn of the unfamiliar yet beautiful idea of a dress by none other than the witch Aileen. As for keeping an eye on Charlotte, Aileen discusses her idea of recommending Sophia to the Imperial Palace and having her spy on the lady. Asher chuckles as he sees her execute this idea and remarks on how adorable she is. Though this flusters Aileen initially, she realizes he must have only said this since she listens to whatever he says like a pet. On the other hand, Charlotte gets prepared for the event too by her sly lady-in-waiting. She hopes to meet the man from that night at the ball, hoping to remind him of his place. She was sure he must be a noble, as he was wearing a family crest. Aileen has the maid she accidentally hurt with the book previously in charge of her overall preparation for the event after hearing she has formerly worked in a boutique and is best at styling. Then, finally the long-awaited day of the harvest ball arrived. She enters the hall and notices how even the Grand Chamberlain doesn't hide his dislike for her. Asher accompanies her, introducing himself as Sebastian Agate, the second son of the Agate family. The Grand Chamberlain gets confused as he has never heard that name from the Agate family and thought the Viscount only had one child, but with his charm magic, to Asher makes the Chamberlain believe he was secretly adopted by the noble family and is granted entry. Aileen knew that with an ability like that, it was only natural that Asher would see ordinary people as insignificant and weak, and after consistently observing his abilities, she figured out the basic principles of how it functions. It can be risky to use if there are people who don't have any desires or have them already fulfilled, and he's not completely brainwashing people but merely bewitching them. The ugly desires one desperately wants to hide quickly become one's weaknesses in Asher's grasp. Once one falls under his spell, it's impossible to break free. However, when one begins to doubt the differences between fantasy and reality, they will eventually come to their senses. But even when they do, Asher reveals, they usually do not know about being under his spell. But Asher reveals that in a rare instance, if one possesses a body and mind that surpass the limits of a human, they can immediately tell something has happened to them upon waking up from his spell. This makes Aileen realize his ability won't work on Victor or any of the supporting male leads in the novel. 
She then asks if it will work for Charlotte. He says it might. But since she didn't seem worth wasting his ability on, he stopped midway. Before Eileen can ask about his encounter with Charlotte, the horn blows and their entry is announced. As expected, sneers and murmurs surround Aileen as people wonder what kind of rag she is wearing. She wonders how people are even noticing her when someone so handsome is by her side. As if he read her mind, Asher answers that it's because he erased most of his presence and no one will pay attention to him unless they really focus. Suddenly, a high-ranking mage approaches Aileen. Seeing his sky-blue hair and gentle, deep blue eyes, Eileen recognizes him as Archmage Septimus, one of the supporting male leads. Septimus mumbles, calling Asher Calum King of Rotolo. Asher excuses himself from Aileen, saying he will have a chat with Spatimus. After warning her not to leave the hall or talk to anyone unworthy, he leaves. While Aileen awkwardly stands, she notices some women gossiping about her. But they cringe when they see her staring at them. This makes me wonder why they are even gossiping about her so loudly when they fear her. She finally realizes it's because she, the author, made them like that to anger Aileen. But she's here to twist the rules of the world she made and ignore their nonsense, pissing them off more. She faces the pathetic ladies head-on and asks Lady Cotton to have a chat. She has memorized the names of the influential houses of the Empire. Her father, Duke Mertensia, is a key figure in nobility, so she researched details about other nobles and their families. And so begins conversing with Lady Cotton, deciding to put her in her place, but also remembering that in a war of nerves between refined nobles, the one who loses their composure first is the one who loses the battle. This is why the original Aileen lost an earmark and earned a bad reputation. Using her higher power status than the Count's daughter, she wins the battle. But Lady Cotton remarks at the end that the topic of business is irrelevant to women, as once they get married, their husbands will inherit their signiori anyway. This leaves Aileen dumbfounded. In this era, where patriarchy is prevalent, women's rights are legally tied to men. When a noble lady officially marries and becomes someone's wife, the custody and signiori of a woman are passed on from the woman's father to her husband. Simply put, a woman's freedom and rights are always held by the man beside her. But in rare cases, there are cases of trivy marriages where a free relationship is formed out of life without signori. Aileen impulsively reveals she will be taking a paramour for herself, as no one except her can control herself. The noble ladies flee after hearing this while the old nobleman begins to speak up about her bad upbringing to say such a thing. They, however, get interrupted as Duke Mertensia asks, if they have a problem with how he raises his children. There are three great houses in the late empire. One is the Ducal of Mertensia, which is said to be second in power after the emperor. The current head of this house is Vincent Mertensia. His interjection surprises Aileen because this man would previously walk past her without batting an eye. Vincent interrogates the noble who dared make such remarks about Aileen. The man reluctantly explains that he means his daughter is unruly and is at an age when she must be obedient to her husband. The nobly says he understands Aileen grew up without a mother and was only surrounded by men. But still, she must get married and not entertain the idea of having a paramour. His ridiculous remarks annoy Aileen. But before she can say something to her defense, Vincent stops her. He then faces the noble telling him to mind his business while Aileen satisfactorily watches the scene unfold. Vincent points out how the noble's second son had to break off his engagement after fooling around with a much younger woman, yet he has the leisure to worry about others. The noble defends his son, saying he's young and made a mistake. Besides, all men are bound to have at least one woman-related issue. His words continue to make Aileen speechless. But the noble soon flees after apologizing when Vincent indirectly threatens to reveal the crimes his son committed that he tried covering up. Vincent then turns to look at his daughter. Even as an author, the protagonist couldn't make sense of this situation. She sets Vincent as a character who hates Aileen because his wife passed away. The Duke was widely known as the Lord of Iron and Blood, but he was the ultimate romantic who loved his wife dearly. 
18 years ago, Duchess Margaret Mertensia passed away while giving birth to Aileen. And because of that, the Duke thought that Aileen was the monster born by eating her mother. Apparently, he had no choice but to take her side. Later, as Aileen thinks of the idea of a paramour, she gets interrupted as Asher approaches her, asking what the conditions are for becoming her paramour. But she doesn't have an answer. As she said all those things impulsively, she pondered over her ideal type. It is someone who can be supportive, encouraging, and communicative. She also wants someone who has black hair and an alluring atmosphere, a very specific ideal type. She shifts the topic swiftly, asking what happened to Septimus. He smiles, saying he reasoned with him and sent him on his way. Before she can question further, they get interrupted by the arrival of the main characters, Crown Prince Victor and Charlotte. The moment Victor stepped into the ballroom, all eyes turned towards him. With each step, he overflowed with such natural dignity and grace that it was unparalleled by anyone in the Empire. However, Charlotte soon softened his strong presence. As they held hands, Aileen could literally hear her literacy garbage alive and moving in front of her. Plus, Charlotte was dressed like Cinderella, which annoyed her more, and she wished for them to get out of her sight. But it seems Victor wants her to die and do the same. Charlotte glances at Aileen Mertensia and finds her pretty. She heard Aileen call her a scentless flower because her beauty was the only thing she possessed. But whoever thinks that is wrong is indeed wrong. She could smell Aileen's dangerous scent even from this distance. Her eyes widen as she sees that Aileen's partner is none other than the man she met the other night. The crest she saw must have been of House Mertensia, like master, like butler. She smiles, hoping to make him pay for belittling her for being a flower. She tugs at Victor's sleeve and smiles, hoping for the man to look at her and feel inferior. But to her shock, he ignores her. Even Aileen notices how everyone except for Asher is staring at the main character, Charlotte. Asher remarks that he hates it when someone tries to control his destiny however they please. But if it's for someone who wants to control their destiny, albeit clumsily, he would gladly offer himself to be taken advantage of. While people praise Charlotte's dress, they compare it to the rag Aileen is wearing. However, Paul Ank comes to Aileen's aid revealing how her dress is exquisite and truly suits her, making people's opinions change. Even Princess Cordelia, Victor's sister, approached her and inquired about the Kemi's dress. Since Paul Ank will be executed if anyone discovers he made a dress for the witch, she lies and says that she designed the dress solely by herself. She even asks for one to be made for her. Plus, she is supposed to be a meaner character who supports Charlotte and doesn't even approach Eileen. Having grown up in a strict and restricted environment, Cordelia envied Charlotte's free life, which was steely, and it was her role to live vicariously by caring for Charlotte. But it seems Cordelia would rather break free of her restraints by wearing a Kemi's dress than live through someone else. And Aileen had every intention to gladly support someone who appreciated the value of the dress in finding their freedom. Aileen's goal today was to make her presence known while keeping up the appearance of a villainess. She has to become a dangerous figure who can threaten Charlotte's position without openly intimidating her. That's the only way she can survive the loop. She glances at Charlotte, and to her surprise her face is cold, unlike who she's supposed to be. But seeing her smile again, she thinks she must be mistaken. Aileen later moves to the balcony before the clock can strike 12 to see whether the loop will repeat itself, with Asher closely following behind. Down, she sees Charlotte dancing with Victor happily. It was indeed a romantic scene she created. Suddenly the Archmage interrupts them, and in a haphazard stage he reveals he will be finding a fiancé to prevent the end of the world. Aileen realizes this must be because of whatever Asher did before. She and Asher get to talking, and Aileen points out how he is not even getting paid as a butler. Plus, she has been lying to him about how she's the creator of this world, and he's just a side character who knows. He never even made an appearance. And if he were to find out the truth, he would destroy her. This is why it is essential to keep some distance from him so they can walk away from each other in the end. 
The clock finally strikes 12 and out of the blue, Asher closes the distance between them and kisses her, saying he will take his payment. That's definitely not what Aileen had in mind for keeping a distance between the two. And so, from that day on, Asher took advantage of the situation and she was able to keep her distance from the two. Asher took advantage of the holes in what she said to draw a line between them and began to ask for payment whenever he got the chance. But his requests were too minor for her to get scared of. For example, he may be sitting on his lap or lightly embracing her as he places a kiss on her forehead or cheek. She knew he didn't like her but was taking her as a pet. But she has no intention of being tamed that easily. One day, Vincent calls Aileen to his study and randomly asks if she wants to inherit a title so she can succeed as Countess Kintyre. The influential families of the Letty Empire can inherit more than one title. And so the Duke of Mertensia also holds several other titles, including the title of Count Kintyre. Vincent reveals she cannot have a paramour without a title. And as a woman, she must be powerful so people don't dare speak against her. Aileen is shocked. As it turns out, Vincent is open-minded and is trying to help her. She suspiciously asks if he wants to use her, but he says no. She looks towards Asher for help, and Asher uses his ability after his usual payment. After using his charm magic, Asher makes Vincent reveal the truth. Vincent confesses he has never neglected Eileen, but rather did everything he could so she should live her life to her heart's content. This makes Aileen realize the man didn't know how to express his true feelings to his children. Later on, as Aileen is about to go to the ball, where attendance is mandatory, her brother Aslan stops her, saying she needs to go with him. Even Asher makes her go and advises her to build a better relationship with him. And so Aslan and Aileen set off in a carriage rather awkwardly. As Aileen reads Linty's novel, Aslan glares at the book annoyingly. When he calls the book a piece of trash, Aileen rambles on and on about Linty, making him oddly blush. They soon arrive, and Aileen finally gets why Aslan wanted her to accompany him. Several ladies surrounded Aslan immediately to court him rather openly. Aileen makes her way to the front as a true villain and acts accordingly, saving her brother from the passionate ladies by accompanying him. Aslan hesitantly thanks her, but his words get overpowered by the announcement made for the arrival of Victor and Charlotte. Aslan then says that he turns away without repeating his gratitude. Soon, Victor begins his cheesy confession speech for Charlotte and talks about how much he loves her. As the author and writer of such a cringeworthy proposal, Aileen feels embarrassed and annoyed beyond relief. To prevent the loop, Aileen recalls how the original villainess left the ballroom after hearing the confession while thinking of taking revenge. This was how her future actions were foreshadowed for the reader. On the other hand, Charlotte, who remained in the hall, was congratulated and showered with affection. Even the few nobles who disapproved of her accepted her. But that wasn't the case right now. On top of their reluctant attitude, it seems like they were pitying Aileen instead of sneering at her. Even Charlotte seems to be pitying her. Aileen wonders why the main characters are purposely goading her on and making her suffer as if they truly love each other. They should make an oath of eternal love to each other. She has no intention of hiding her own pride and walking away when the oh-so-beloved crown prince is making her seem like a villainess when she hasn't even done anything yet. She calmly approaches the two leads and greets them, but Victor keeps his word and tells her to get lost pretty rudely. But Aileen is confident, knowing she has the princess by her side. She throws wine at the prince, but he isn't that phased considering he is only concerned when it comes to. She then reveals that she holds no resentment against Charlotte and that she did no wrong to her, but who she truly resents is Victor. She then leaves, saying she no longer likes him, thinking she will make them pay. Outside, a worried-looking Aslan approaches her, assuring her he tried smoothing things out over what happened, and instead of getting angry, he asks if she's fine. As they talk, Aslan... Aslan reveals how it's good that she got rejected by overhearing such a ridiculous confession that isn't even shown in romance novels. This makes Aileen finally realize her brother has a secret interest in reading romance novels. She goes home with him and excitedly leads him to her secret library filled with romance novels. Asher watches her and decides to prepare snacks. 
As they talk more, Aslan reluctantly reveals how he's friends with Linta. This shocks Eileen and she asks why he quit writing novels, to which Aslan reveals the person has to inherit a title soon and can't keep writing them. Aileen sighs sadly and tells him to tell Linta how she will keep supporting him, whatever path he takes, and whenever he wants to return to writing. Aslan blushes and thanks her, confusing her. And she tells him to tell Linta about this. For the past few months. For the past few months, she has been having the same dream over and over again. That wretched woman curses him, saying that he has no choice but to love her. He even consulted the priests about whether it was a prophetic dream, and the priest said everything was the will of Lizrivi. He couldn't help but think of what she said to him and how she poured wine over him instead of charity. Meanwhile, Aileen was free until the next loop in next year's spring. She decides to utilize her time. By rekindling her long-forgotten dreams, she walks to her father's study, expressing her desire to inherit the title of Countess Kintyre. Ever since that moment, Eileen began cramming on what she'd need to know to inherit a title. This is something Aslan has had a head start on, but she has no regrets. Now, she has the desire to see how far she can go. And she finally dares to get to know the person who has helped her grow so much. When she asks who he is, Asher asks if she has finally given up on avoiding him. Before she answers his question, Asher confesses that he was enslaved. This shocks Aileen to her core. She notices the wound around his ear and asks if it hurts since he got a new piercing to restrain his mana. She feels guilty, as he has to get hurt so much for staying by her side. All his accessories are used to suppress his powers, are slowly beginning to fail. It finally sinks into Aileen that the mere presence of a warlock brings misfortune to those around them. She finally understands why Asher likes to hold her, touch her, or even kiss her. Aside from his fellow warlocks, she is the only one he can have physical contact with. It never occurred to her, and she made her judgments. She helps him pierce without hurting himself and ends up in his lap. He doesn't let her go, so she gives in and hugs him. Asher makes her realize they can prevent the loop from happening rather than wait for the next spring. And so, as Aileen takes his hand to stand up, she ponders how she will deal with Asher as things are progressing smoothly. But as she is jolted back to reality, Asher calls her by her name for the first time, and she realizes she might not be able to avoid Asher at all. Meanwhile, two men, an assassin and a warlock, are on their way to Asher. Asher and Asher are on their way to Asher. Asher and Asher are on their way to Asher. Asher and Asher are on their way to Asher. Asher and Asher are on their way to Asher. Asher and Asher are on their way to Asher. The assassin and a thug, Vasili and Linda, have figured that the day of Falangi has been repeating itself over and over again. But Linda wasn't happy that the only one apart from him who knows is this beast. Living creatures and beings with magical powers inherently bring misfortune to those around them. That's why they have been erased since ancient times. Then came the conflict between the two. Between those with divine powers and those with magical powers. The temple, after having emerged victorious from that battle, naturally decided to oppress warlocks for their survival. It seemed like the era of warlocks would end before it even started. But then the warlocks gathered and established a kingdom in the land of the dead, the Rotulo Kingdom. The kingdom's very existence proved the value of magic and the abilities of a regular citizen. Their subject in the Rotulo Kingdom was equivalent to those of the most talented person of the underworld, Night Street. The world had shunned warlocks for so long that they had no knowledge or tolerance for magic, and the Rotulo Kingdom thoroughly took advantage of that vulnerability. They were a law unto themselves. It was natural for the master of Night Street, who committed all sorts of crimes, to show interest in a warlock with boundless potential. Fifteen years ago, when he heard that a baby born in a rural slum was bringing misfortune to those around him, he whisked away the child before the temple or Rutulo kingdom could step in. That child was Vasili, the failure among failures. Vasili, known for causing chaos and lacking direction, has frustrated Linda within the Kobo Guild. Despite Linda's attempts to control him, Vasili destroys the target's estate, 
leading Linda to become both a warlock and a warlock, both angry and intrigued. Vasily claims to have a hunch about the person responsible for the time loop, prompting Linda to order him to find them. Meanwhile, Aileen and Asher, outside Linda's building, discover the illegal activities occurring in the supposedly Empire-approved establishment. Linda's building hosts a secret slave auction in its basement, requiring strict conditions for participation. Aileen and Asher aim to resolve the situation before a new warlock arrives. However, a time loop occurs. Their mission involves preventing Duke Trandia from meeting Charlotte, who is set to be kidnapped by Ayla in the upcoming spring. A countess has Charlotte kidnapped and ready to be auctioned here, that is until Duke Trandia saves her and falls for her. Aileen finds her in the basement, along with another supporting male and frees them. She then explains to the Duke how Charlotte's slave contract is a reason good enough to destroy the underworld if she accepts the Prince's confession. This puts Charlotte in an odd spot, and she grows frustrated as she loses the men who claim to love her, all starting with the appearance of Aileen. While she discussed her plans to meet her family in Angelo's domain, Victor revealed she would have to pass through the dangerous Burke Mountains. And for that, he assigns her to the Master Knight, Lennox. Though Charlotte asks him to come, Victor confesses it's better to leave her alone if they take some time apart, making her realize he's growing distant from her. Meanwhile, Aileen reveals to Asher how Charlotte will become stranded in the Burke Mountains with Lennox, where he will gain feelings for her. Asher interrogates how she knows this, since she only gets revelations when there's a time loop. Aileen recalls how she lied about this and made up another excuse, saying that she has been getting to know them lately. Though Asher doesn't believe her fully, he lets it go for the time being. They decide to travel to Karzin before Charlotte to get rid of the monsters in the mountains. Reaching there, Asher suggests she kill the core monster to get rid of them all as an option with the rest, including how he must go back to where he belongs. Considering how, because of his mana, this problem arose. Aileen decides to have the monster killed. She begins learning how to kill monsters with Asher's help. Time flew by, and the day of the next monster hunting expedition finally arrived. To the Crazen Knight's surprise, the Witch Lady could easily eliminate the rotten trees in their way and even help one of their men. Though her swordsmanship seemed weak, she used magic to get her way. In the end, they all praise her and even apologize for their previous rude behavior towards her since they underestimated her. After several more expeditions, the knights came to trust and rely on Aileen completely. They took her on expeditions almost every other day, helping her improve her stamina and skills. She also came to notice how incredibly fast she heals from the training scars and scratches she gets. But she didn't tell Asher this because she doubts it must be a divine power to one that Asher despises. She turns glum, wondering if he will abandon her after using her for this. She hopes to distance herself before he finds out she's the author of this world. On one such expedition, they find the second-degree Imperial Knights injured who have been escorting Charlotte. Parties were divided, and Aileen led the search party. They reached the cliff from where Lennox and Charlotte jumped in the original. With Asher's suggestion, Aileen agrees to jump to save the other two and be known as the Savior, so Asher helps her jump down safely. Meanwhile, an injured Lennox helps bring Charlotte to safety in a cave and treats her wounded leg. There they get surrounded by monsters, but Lennox gets overpowered. He even overhears Charlotte bickering about whether he should protect her by sacrificing himself, or if he's useless. But he thinks it's just his hallucination, as the angelic Charlotte would never say such a thing. Thankfully, Aileen comes to his aid and defeats the monsters. She is then confronted by a hallucinating Charlotte, who blames her for stealing everything from her making Aileen realize the character she made is far from being angelic. The next morning, the crazed knights and Asher join them, and they all praise Aileen. But Charlotte gains their attention as she cries about her wounded leg. Asher volunteers to help, and Charlotte demands privacy to reveal her wound. As she converses with Innocent and irritates Asher about the night they first met, Aileen feels her heart throb and realizes that Charlotte is trying to flirt with him. She pretends to snub her butler in front of everyone and tells everyone to go away, except for Asher and herself. 
She then ignores Charlotte's requests to talk to Asher privately and heals her leg. But seeing Lennox and Asher, Charlotte feigns that she cannot move still. But Eileen spoils her plans to seek attention by giving her a piggyback ride. A sudden realization then dawns on her. Seeing how jealous she was of Charlotte flirting with Asher, it seems she likes him. The bizarre thought itself makes Aileen drop Charlotte, who says it seems she hates her. But Aileen says she cannot hate such a lovely lady like her. This confession is coming from the mind of the parent who created her. Although her partner is the infamous two-timer Victor, Aileen vows to make Charlotte's love come true at all costs. She even begins to ride with Charlotte on the horse, making Asher grit his teeth. He then randomly tells her that he will only wait for one day, confusing Aileen. By night, Aileen is woken up by Asher, and she immediately hears screaming noises outside. It turns out that the evil monsters have left the mountain and reached the civilian area, thanks to the warlock. This makes Aileen feel like she's in a dream. This makes Aileen angry, as he has definitely crossed a line. But Asher reveals the stage has been set for her to be a true villainess and the civilian savior. It's a sacrifice for greater things. She calls him out for it, but he reveals that if she truly cared about the lives of these people, she should have kicked him out of the empire by now. Aileen reveals that she has priorities. How can she possibly kick him out when it's clear he comes before all of her desires and wishes? Aileen steps forward. She looks back and realizes she just confessed to him, but there is no doubt that he must have noticed this all. Asher grabs her, asking if she's leaving after saying all this. Aileen says she has no time to be distracted by him in such a serious situation, but Asher reminds her that she still has to know the core monster to defeat them all. Aileen agrees to pay the price, and Asher kisses her passionately. But Aileen could tell that she's not the only one who's going to be in trouble. Well, it wasn't just a kiss, but rather a beast trying to mark his territory. He pulls her closer, telling her to teach him, revealing it's her first time. Aileen's heart softens as she realizes she's the first woman to ever come into his life, and they kiss once again. He finally reveals the core as a copy puppet, one of the ghost-type monsters without a physical form. Asher then assures him that she must appear at the most dramatic moment and that he has been killed. Aileen becomes dumbfounded as she realizes she has been fooling her into revealing her true feelings. She pouts, thinking it's unfair that she's the only one who revealed her true feelings. She asks why he kissed her to get him to confess, too. He asks if she is ready to reveal her secrets and not run away, which she refuses. He then says they consider it an act of impulse for now, and they kiss yet again, with Aileen teaching him how to while he compliantly goes with the flow. They finally go outside to see the knights fighting the monsters that, oddly, didn't seem to harm them. Aileen kills the copy core, and they scurry away. She and Asher then go to the forest to find the source. On their way, Asher reveals how he knows of her growing holy powers, and he tells her that she is the one who killed him. And it doesn't matter to him as long as she's not God herself. This makes her glum, but she gets interrupted as they hear something nearby. They hurry there in the hope of finding the core of the evil monsters. After defeating a black orb there, Asher was mesmerized by her AKS if she were a fallen angel. She asks what she is, to which he confidently states that he will drag her down to hell so they can be together. Aileen finally musters up the courage and asks if he's really Asher. 500 years ago, there was a kingdom called El Dorado, the sacred city of gold. One day, an evil warlock completely wiped out its history and race turning the city into a mere legend. Could it be that Asher is the same evil warlock as 500 years ago? Asher replies that whatever she wants to hear from him, he the answer she already has in her heart is the right one. Aileen was pretending to be clueless because she wanted to. He truly was the king of Rotolo. She asks why he's still alive, to which he answers that he scorned God. She asks why, somehow knowing he wouldn't have done such a thing without a good reason. To her, the pain Asher felt back then was more important than some old kingdom that had faded into history. She asks what made him scorn God in the first place, making Asher chuckle. He pecks her, he pokes her forehead, 
saying this is why she can't be God as she's too humane. After freeing the knights and people from the tyranny of Baron Karzin and entrusting his sons with the future of the estate, Eileen and Asher took their leave, with Lennox and Charlotte leaving a day early. Surprisingly for Aileen, Charlotte seemed to avoid her. Unlike her, Lennox expressed his gratitude to Aileen for saving the estate and them as well. It seems Lennox is continuing to stay true to his character as a man of virtue. She expressed how flattered she was and told him to keep her holy powers a secret. When the messengers finally could enter the estate since the threat of monsters had diminished, Aileen learned his brother had been writing her several letters. But more shockingly, it seems Islam misunderstood that she left home because of him. Aslan's letter continues to state simple concerns, only to end in a full guilt trip over the possibility of having made her uncomfortable. Suddenly, Aslan appears in her room and says he misunderstood that she left because he lied to her before about Lint. But she doesn't get it, so he drops the topic. They ride a carriage back home and stop at an inn on the way. Since there was one single bed and a double bed available, Aslan hurriedly took the single bed key and ran away, leaving Asher and Aileen to share one. Aileen realizes all she wants Asher to do is fall apart in her hands so that he can no longer live without her. And even if he comes to hate her for what she did, he will ultimately forgive her no matter what. They both tease each other and kiss passionately. Asher changes places, telling her to stop driving him crazy. She asks if she's really the first woman he's been with, and he agrees. He then asks if she's been with someone else. And she reluctantly replies that she did once, making him glare. Thank God Aileen's ex was back on Earth, or he would have been killed. As they embraced each other, Aileen knew both of them were aware one of them would be ruined. One to be a part of the other, thoroughly and completely. Meanwhile, Aslan feels stupid for leaving the butler alone with his sister. He goes there to find pocket dimensions surrounding the front door. The next morning, when he inquires about it from his sister, Asher replies that he learned it to prevent intruders from entering. They finally reach the teleportation center. There, before Aileen can teleport using her powers, she finds a monster copy running around. Before she can catch it, it disappears without a trace. Suddenly, a man approaches her, saying she is finally alone. It was Vasily. But before he can try to kill Aileen, Asher comes and cuts off his arm. After exchanging a few words and reattaching his arm, Asher realizes Vasiki is the warlock kid who disappeared a few years ago. Vasily joins them after some suspicion, disguised as Aileen's aide. Asher lends a few of his piercings to Vasily to help him control his mana. His subordinates finally discover his whereabouts and have him come back to manage state affairs. Asher reveals the boy's identity, telling his subordinate to teach him and Aileen as the person he truly loves. Aileen truly wants to claim as his from head to toe. And so, Asher began to prepare to leave, telling Aileen he would leave Louis with her, whom she ordered around as much as she wanted. Aileen agrees, telling him to attend to his matters. And when he comes back, she will welcome him with open arms and he can do anything for her. Do anything. After sending Asher to the East Continent, Aileen started going about her hectic life at the estate. She checks on the letter she received when she was at the Carson. It turns out there was one from Victor, whom she accidentally stood up as he had invited her to the palace garden. But he had another letter sent, which is another request for a meeting tomorrow. Fully armed, she heads to the palace to confront the stuck-up Victor by dressing up boldly. There, Victor rambles on about how he developed feelings for her and has lost interest in Charlotte as she isn't as angelic as he thought her to be, pissing off Aileen since she created the characters. She hates Victor the most, especially him and Charlotte. And adding to her misfortune, Charlotte overhears him and runs away tearfully. However, Victor continues to piss Aileen, saying he will still make the obedient and docile Charlotte Emperor, but he can't help but control his feelings. At the moment, Aileen forgets about the loop and knows she should have gotten rid of that hopeless male lead of the century before anything. Later, Aileen approaches a worried Charlotte, who confronts her for even stealing the crown prince from her. Aileen smiles calmly, saying she likes this side of her more than the face she always puts up. 
She reveals how she genuinely rooted for the crown prince and herself, and since she has lost everything, she should be herself. The one who should love Charlotte first is herself, not the man who pursues her. Her worth is within her. But to bring it out, Aileen explains, she should start by learning to take care of her problems. When Aileen reached home, she found smoke filling the hall. As it turns out, Aslan was trying to make food for his father's birthday and even tried writing a report-like letter. Their father enters the kitchen after seeing the havoc and takes matters into his own hands. He makes a cake efficiently, surprising the other two. It turns out that it was even his birthday today. Aslan tells Vicent they will perfect the recipe by his birthday. As Aileen, the villainess of Lady Lily, Minji achieved many things. She brought Aileen back to her colleagues, friends, and family. She brought her happiness too. But when it came to her as young Minji, she didn't know what she had accomplished until now. At least not until this one day, when the time loop continued. Linda came late at midnight and killed everyone on the estate, and then Aileen too. The loop continues with their deaths in some cases. Aileen even killed herself. This endless loop made her finally realize why Asher seems to hate divinity so much. It is because Lezrev is nothing but a bystander watching humans suffer endlessly. On the other hand, Asher is tired of going through the loop around 70 to 80 times now. 70 to 80 times. But there is nothing he can do, as it doesn't even take five minutes for the time to repeat itself. To return to the late empire, he had to cross an entire continent, and it was impossible to arrive in such a short time. It is in this helpless moment that he realizes that he already belongs to. Aileen. It didn't matter if she was a god or something else. He even asked the king of Jinwan Kingdom to help, but the soul says he couldn't travel. He couldn't travel past the ocean and would lose his chance at reincarnation, as Calum has. When standing before God, humans are so incredibly helpless and weak. This doesn't change, no matter how powerful a mere human becomes. Meanwhile, Linda is killing Aileen yet again. She suddenly sees an illusion of Lezrev pitying Ekorayv, the goddess who poured out her everything to humanity but got deceived in the end, the one whose fragment even Linda had consumed. This made Aileen finally realize that she is God, she tells Linda to stop and even commands that he die. It works, and she makes him alive again, cursing him to destroy his existence in order to torture him. Meanwhile, Lucas Asher, or rather, Calum's subordinate, finally arrives at Mertensia's estate and, shockingly, finds the place overflowing with the power of the gods. There, Vasily reveals everything to him. Louis approaches Aileen and reveals it took him a long to come, as warlocks aren't supposed to approach God. The same goes for his master, Calum, who detests God the most. Aileen asks why that is. Asher's oldest desire was to face the end. What the seven-year-old slave boy wanted the most was to put an end to his suffering. He used to plead with God to free him and let him rest in peace eternally. Four centuries before the Leti Empire would be called the land under the radiant sun, so many had sacrificed for the Empire's prosperity. The Leti subject state, El Dorado, began secretly researching ways to become gods themselves. And among the countless children dragged for the experiments, Asher was one of them. He was put through endless torture and experiments, but whenever he writhed in pain, he was exposed to holy power. God never heard his pleas, and he soon realized it. And thus he consumed the fragment of God stored in the deepest part of the research temple. That was when Lezrev sent an angel to him with her answer. He was punished by having his right to die taken away. He was then eternally bound to the human world. Devastated by his fate, Asher killed the angel on the spot. Even so, Lezrev kept her silence. To test her, Asher continues to consume every fragment of God he can get his hands on and destroy all the temples in his way. He completely wipes out the kingdom and its people. But still, Lezrev didn't answer his mad outcry. Her silence seems to tell him that no matter how he tried, he was still the enslaved person whose soul was shackled to the earth. That was the start of his boredom with this mean, meaningless, and sickening world. Despite his sins piling up and creating a warlock empire, there was no end to Asher. 
but these past months have made him feel alive for the first time. Soon enough, Asher returns to her, and seeing her cry with guilt, he says he doesn't care if she's Lezrev and wants her by his side. It turns out Lezrev is a part of her, also known as the Cold Heart. Meanwhile, she was sent to the human world to be reincarnated over and over as punishment for loving humans pathetically. Before Aileen can answer Asher, she loses consciousness as Lezrev calls out to her. Aileen opens his eyes to the world of God as Echo Reeve. There, she meets Lezrev. She inquires from Lezrev how she ended up returning here and about the novel she wrote as Yun Minji. Lezrev says she doesn't know, and it is something she must remember on her own. Since she has always loved humans, it seems she wrote the novel to cherish her memories of them in this world. And as for reincarnating in Aileen's body, it must be because of a foolish promise she made to the body. Aileen realizes it's all true. Lezrev reveals that it seems she kept repeating the days in order to follow through with her promise. In other words, Aileen is the one who puts herself in the original Aileen's body and keeps turning back in time. Yet she had no clue and was basically pulling out her hair while trying to figure out what was going on. Lezrev reveals it wasn't a coincidence she met the warlock, as he's like an alien substance in the world. This makes Aileen ask why she ignored him all those times he called out to her. Lezrev comprehends that she did answer his calls a few times by sending an angel saying that she couldn't do anything for him, no matter what he tried. After all, she is no more than a part of her as her cold heart and overseer of this world. So basically, Eileen was the irresponsible boss away on a business trip, while Lezrev was her answering machine. Lezrev reveals to her how Asher is thinking of destroying this world and how she must come back to rule effectively as the creator. Aileen finally wakes up to find Asher by her side, who has brought her to Rotulo. She contemplates telling him that this reunion won't last long. She reveals everything about her identity to him and how all the misery he went through was because of him, and she tells him to punish her. Words couldn't describe the depth of the kiss Asher gave her in the moment. It felt like he was whispering to her that it was enough. She didn't need to say anything anymore. She was sure that was his way of showing mercy and forgiveness. Eileen didn't know that she was the one who was going to kill him. Aileen didn't know that she was the one who was going to kill him. Aileen didn't know that she was the one who was going to kill him. She didn't know where the ties between Asher and her started, but she must have survived through countless reincarnations to be with him. Aileen finally reveals to Asher that she isn't supposed to be here, or it will corrupt the balance of the human world. She can only remain here for one more day. Asher remarks that, while he no longer cares whether she's a god or not, he'd rather die than watch her leave him. He asks for her real name, and she reveals it to be Echo. He calls her Echo, saying he will drag her down to hell so they can be together. She agrees to pay for her sins, and Asher agrees with her. Asher then has Aileen wish for his spell to work on her since it cannot do to her powers. She trusts him and complies, but he doesn't reveal what spell he cast, saying time will tell and that this is her punishment. He then reveals to his Echo how he had this one wish his entire life, that is, to be killed. But if he had died, he wouldn't have met her. Now, he doesn't want to die, and as long as he keeps embracing her, he doesn't mind living forever like a god, and he says he knows she is willing to fall from the heavens for him. She prepares to leave for the god world to retrieve her memories, but she knows she needs to hurry because a short moment in that world equals a month in the human world. That's when she realizes that she can't make Asher wait that long. Though she felt sad thinking about this, she was relieved that Asher could live longer than normal humans. Reaching God's world, Echo Reeve is shocked to learn she came into Aileen's body, and even Asher had come with her. It turns out he had previously cast a spell that binds souls to her so that they live and die together, and so he can die as long as she does, and so he can be a god. As the story goes on, the story of Asher is told by a god. The god of all people. A god. They then kiss passionately as they reach the human world. People believed that she had left for a long trip with her butler, Sebastian. She didn't return to the Mertensia state until an entire season had passed. When she came back, 
the incredibly shocking news was waiting for her. Linte was going to release his new novel, the story before it got published. But seeing how familiar Linte's writing is to that of her brother, she is finally able to fit the puzzle pieces together. She confronts him and strikes a favorable deal with him. Aslan would give up his inherited title as Duke to Aileen since she wanted a high seat in power, and she would free him of his responsibilities so he could write as he pleased. Even their father agreed. Aileen confessed during the meeting that she loved him, making him choke on his drink. It turns out their father was, in fact, really loving. In order to fulfill her duties as Aileen here, she has decided to relinquish her powers to Lesrev only until Aileen's body has perished. To prevent Lesrev from being burdened by the workload, Aileen asks for help from the god of another world. She even collaborated with Charlotte, who has come to realize the crown prince doesn't really love her. In opening her apparel brand, Elif, meaning freedom in an ancient language, she started it with both Charlotte and Polence who'd since given up his position as the imperial designer. And Charlotte seems to have matured fast and changed a lot. And Aileen was happy. She has decided to live the rest of her life as a villainess because it's the perfect title for her to pursue her dreams without anyone getting in the way. However, there is one peculiar rumor going about her that she has been unable to ignore. People seem to believe she stole away the crown prince's lady. Though it was outrageous, she and Charlotte chose not to get involved. However, one person was affected by the rumor. Asher approaches her, suggesting they get bound by social constructs now, too. Aileen agrees, wanting to let the world know he's her man, and asks him to marry her. He kisses her hand, telling her to make him her paramour for this life. Aileen knew he must have been fine with it because he knew this was only the beginning of their relationship. She agrees to accept him as her paramour with all her heart, knowing he will succeed in it, just as she did by being her butler. This part ends here. Thank you for watching till the end. It took a lot of time and energy to make these kinds of videos, so please subscribe to my channel to watch more interesting Manhwa stories. Share and comment on this video if you like this part.